morning. It is a beautiful day, and we are going to worship the Lord today. We're going to open with a word of prayer, and then Pastor Mike is going to lead us in the, the reading of a psalm. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Jesus, we love you. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that your presence would come, that you would uh, be in this place, that you would uh, just make yourself known to us today. Lord, we, we know that you're here, and we thank you, and we welcome you, and we want to lift you up today because you are good, and you are God, and we thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalms 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. May the peoples praise you, O oh God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For, the, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O oh God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the lands will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and the ends of the earth will fear him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some may trust in horses. Some may trust in chariots. Oh, but I, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in their riches. Trusting all the Lord. Oh, but I, I will trust in the name of the Lord. There is wonder and power, Holy Spirit power, great redeeming power, power in the name. Trust in the name of the Lord. There is wonder and power, Holy Spirit power, great redeeming power, power in the name, resurrection power, bondage breaking power, power in the name of Jesus. I lift my eyes.
such a great honor for us to be able to come together as a church, as one, to proclaim Jesus' life, his death on the cross and resurrection, and to hold on to that hope that he will come again. So as we, you know, we come together and we think about these things, you know, all are welcome who believe in that truth that Jesus did die and he rose again and you repent of your sins. All who are all those who are welcome to come and take with us. But when we come to this table, we need to remember that we are coming to be renewed in this life, right? That we know we are saved and that we can be one as the Spirit. So let's just take a moment here to prepare our hearts for that table. this truth, that Jesus did indeed die, that he did indeed rose again, and that he will indeed come again. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as you take this bread, remember that this is Jesus' body given to you. Take and remember. And as you take this cup, this is a new covenant with Jesus because of his death on the cross, because his his blood was poured out for you. So take and drink and remember. Lord, we proclaim this truth that you died on the cross for our sins and we are free from them, that you rose again so that we can live with you eternally. We stand in that hope that you will indeed come again, Lord. Bless this time and bless these people. In Jesus' name, amen. I've searched the world It couldn't feel me My times of praise Treasures the faith Never enough And you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Lord, me. 
God says, I will hear the voice of my people, and I will pour out blessings according to their crying out loud to me. Today is the day of the good news, that God took out the good news from heaven and preached it on the street on this earth. Today is the day we all come together to thank him for what he has done in our lives, mystery, and what he has continued to do now, so we may come and meet him in his presence. The Bible says in Matthew 16, verse 27, the Son of Man will come in his glory of the Father with his angel. What are you praying for today? The Bible says Jesus will come in the glory of the Father with his angels to meet all your needs. It doesn't matter how you pray. He understands your heart. He knew who you are. Even as of today, Christ is hidden from our view. But we can see him through the Holy Spirit. He lives in our heart. Today is the day of faith. According to what Paul wrote in the second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven, we walk by faith, not by sight. The first John chapter three, verses two says, in the future, we will see Jesus of who he is. It's the promise to all of you sitting here today and around the world. As we come together as God's children, surrender our lives to him and let him have all our needs according to our lives today. Ask him, and he's so merciful. Would you willing to forgive somebody who did it wrong last week? Are you willing to forgive yourself? So God 
me forgive you and have that peace with you. Maybe sometimes we're dealing with spiritual rats. But Jesus understands. Maybe our body is not that strong enough to praise him, to raise our hands, but our heart sings louder than our voice. According to his word. Shall we pray? Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Every single soul that are sitting in this body right now, I am asking for your healing touch spiritually, physically. Father, Jesus told us to pray to you in anything we ask for. He will continue to carry on our prayers into your presence and communicate to you what we need and what we ask. As we're dealing with this pandemic, our Lord Heavenly Father, we know deeply in our hearts you see it all. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for the whole world that is shaped by your wind of love. We are praying for hospitals today, our Lord Heavenly Father. Have mercy upon them. Father, we ask you to bless our pastor as you deliver your message today. Bless him and his family. Protect them. And all of us who are sitting here today. Father, we love you. And we commit this service to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all God's children say, Amen, Amen. Well, before Pastor Josh comes up, I'm going to invite all the kids that are out there today. So I see a little kid over there, I see two in the back. I know we're all kids at heart, right? But if you're really, really small, I would ask that you come up here in the little row in the very front. I'm going to speak directly to you. So adults, you can listen in on our conversation and participate if you like. So, girls, do you know what book we have been studying for a really long time now? Any guesses? It's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It, it has a lot of chapters in it. Does that help you out at all? No? Okay, well, it's Psalm. We have been in the book of Psalm, and we've been actually studying uh, chapter 119. And it begins with the Hebrew letter pay. Maybe it's going to be up there. It's P-E, but it's pronounced pay. Pay also means mouth. And the letter, if we have it up there, see the bottom? It kind of looks like an open mouth with a tooth hanging down. Do you see it? Well, I, I see it. Anyway, today, the psalmist was also talking about his mouth. So I, wanted, I want you to listen really carefully as I read the scripture to you, okay? It says, starting at verse 129, Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pants, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word, and let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may obey your precepts. May your face shine upon your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. So over the last year, we've talked a lot about the power of God's word. we talked about how God's word um, shows us God's love for us, and it teaches us, well, how to love others as God would love them, right? And I hope you enjoyed learning um, about the meaning of the Psalms. Two weeks ago, Amy talked about um, how sometimes pictures and letters um, have special meaning. It's also true that sometimes the look on our face, right, can have meaning. 
And we call, when we have looks on our face, we call that expression. And it tells other people how we feel. For example, if I have this on my face, what do you think I'm feeling? Happy, right? If I have this on my face, <gasps> surprise, right? Or shocked. Or what? <laughs> like crying, right? I'm probably sad, right? Well, yeah. Earlier, I asked you to listen, right? For what the psalmist said about what? His mouth. In case you missed it, we're going to read it again. It's found in verse 131, and it says, I open my mouth and pant longing for your commands. What do you think that means? Well, usually panting means that we want or need something, like air or water. But the psalmist, what do you think he wanted? He wanted God. He wanted to know God better, to trust him deeper, and to love him more. The psalmist talks about other expressions. In verse 136, he wrote, The streams of tears flow from my eyes, for God's law is not obeyed. And what do you think that means? Anybody? Nobody knows? Nobody has an idea? Well, he says that um, he was sad that the people, um, there's people that didn't love God, and he was sad about that. The psalmist loved God so much that he wanted everybody to know about the love of God the same way that he did. I hope you love God as much as the psalmist does. And before we go, I want you to think about this for a moment. At this very moment, what is the expression of your heart look like today? Is it happy? Joyful? Is it sad? Hopeless? I hope not. But no matter how you feel, God knows exactly how you feel, and he loves you. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the way it speaks power into our lives, the truth that it tells us. Lord, we thank you for the way in which you love us, no matter what we're feeling. And we pray that today, Father God, whatever our heart situation might be like, whatever expression is showing, we pray that you would fill it with your love and with your joy. We love you and we ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Thank you. Thank you, kids. Thank you, Sonia. God is good. It is a good day, friends, uh, because uh, here we are in the Lord's house, worshiping him together. And that's a good thing, amen? Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to read a story, pretty well-known story out of Mark chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 30 in uh, just a moment here. And as you're, as you're turning there, um, it, you know, as, as God's people... I hope that we want to know Jesus better. I want to know Jesus more. I want to know him better than I know him now, and I love the Lord. But as God's people, we need to never come to a place where we just think we got Jesus all figured out. Amen? None of us have Jesus all the way figured out. Jesus is revealing himself through his word, the Holy Spirit, and so we need to strive to know Jesus more And the more we know Jesus, I'm convinced the more we really understand who he is in his word, who he is in our lives and how he works, the more we put our trust in him. And as the people of God, as we trust Jesus and as we place our trust in him, we become people that, that um, uh, get out of the boat and they, they walk on water like Peter, right? Spiritually, we, we're bold and we overcome fear and doubt and worry. We become new creations. We pray bold prayers. Man, I want to live a life that Jesus is called. I, I, I want to live in the fullness of who he is. Do you hear me today? I don't want to just kind of kind of walk in it a little bit. or You, you know, I, I, I want to walk in the fullness of everything that God has for me. I want you to experience, and I want us to experience as a church, I want people to experience the fullness of what it is to be God's creation. And Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending of all things, Jesus, the Lord, was a passionate guy. In fact, he was the most passionate guy that ever walked on this planet. Did you know that? 
He was passionate about uh, the, the Father's house. He was passionate about his church. He was passionate about the Word of God. He was passionate about serving people, so much so that he went to the cross. Jesus was passionate about the things of God, and he's called us to follow him. And if we're his disciples, then we need to be passionate about the things that Jesus is passionate about. Do you believe that, church? This morning, I want to look at, um, when we talk about who Jesus is and, and, and experiencing Jesus, how many of you know that Jesus is a miracle worker? I think we sang that in one of our songs this morning, didn't we? And sometimes I find we don't necessarily talk a whole, whole lot about the miracles of Jesus, or maybe we do, but I don't, I, I don't know. I feel like sometimes we, we, we don't think about the miraculous work of Jesus Christ, And the word of God. And I want to tell you something. That Jesus was not only a miracle worker in this passage we're going to read when he was here physically on the earth. But today we still have a God of miracles. How many of you came to church today and you said, man, pastor, there's a, I, I need a miracle in my life. I need a miracle in this relationship. I need a miracle in this situation, whatever it is, whether it's relational, financial, health, whatever it is. I don't know about you, but there's some miracles that I would love to see God move in my life in. Amen? God still does that. God's still in the miracle business. And we need to know that. And as we seek to know Jesus more and understand who Jesus is, we need to understand that he's a God of miracles. And before we get into the passage here, before we get into Mark chapter 6, I want to say something right up front. I think it's important for us to remember that, that, that Jesus didn't do these miracles. He didn't just do these things just to kind of show off. Jesus wasn't an entertainer. He wasn't just a magician. These are not magic tricks. This isn't, uh, you know, David Copperfield or, or, or whoever. But that Jesus always did his miracles to reveal who God is, to reveal something about himself. And there's always something within the miracle that he wants us to see about who he is and about who we are in light of him. And so today we're going to read one of those miracles. And uh, uh, it's a pretty well-known one. In fact, it's the only miracle that Jesus performed that's in all four Gospels. It can be found in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Um, I said those out of order, but that's okay. Uh, I got Mark in front of me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can find them in all four. And so... It's pretty well known, uh, and as we read this passage, well, let's read it, and then we're going to kind of go back through it. So Matthew, uh, I'm confusing myself, Mark chapter 6, verse 30, it says, The apostles gather around Jesus, and they reported to him all they had done and taught, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all of the towns, and they got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things goes on in verse 35, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Then he answered, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Or would he go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups of the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. 
And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This is the word of the Lord. So we read this passage here, there's, 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 there's four things I want us to look at, four principles that I think, um, uh, you want to receive a move of God in your life, a fresh move, a miraculous move of God in your life, then I believe that we need to position ourselves to receive a move of God in our lives. We have to ready ourselves for what we want God to do, Amen. Sometimes we're just waiting around for God to do something, and God's calling us into something, and we got to step out into it. And so the disciples are in this situation, and Jesus is in this situation. They have this big crowd, and, and, and just to be technical here, it says there were 5,000 men, and, and I know this is kind of messed up by today's, how we do culture today, but they only counted the men at these things. There would have been probably an equal amount of women there and a whole lot of kids. So there were thousands of people here listening to Jesus teach. And as it gets later, people are getting hungry. You know how that gets. (laughs) Pastor's going too long. I'm ready to go to lunch. People get restless. Well, they didn't have Chick-fil-A. They didn't have Jersey Mike's. They, you know, they didn't have, uh, uh, where are you going for lunch today? McDonald's, Taco Bell, they didn't have those either. (laughs) They were out of luck. They were out in the middle of nowhere. No food. And so the disciples see this happening, and and, and they get Jesus and say, you know, uh, we got a problem. These people are getting hungry. It's getting late. We're far away from anything. Uh, And and their answer, I want want you to think about this, and we'll we'll circle back to this, but but their answer was to send the people away. Jesus, you got to tell them to get out of here now because there's a problem coming, and we have to send them away. And so as we look at this, obviously we know that Jesus looks at the problem, and we have this miraculous multiplication of, of, of food, and he feeds everybody. And so the first thing I want us to think about, if we want to position ourselves for a miraculous move of God in our life, in any area, the first thing we need to do is we need to recognize and confess our need for God. You know that? That's hard. Sometimes we just need to come to a place where where we say, God, I just need you. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. It's not a bad thing to come to a place where we're completely relying on God. In fact, that's God's will for our life, that we would live in a place where we're completely dependent on him. That's the starting point of really living in the fullness of God wants to do, is to recognize our need for God. I need God as much today as I ever have. I've been a Christian for 30 plus years. I think I can put a 40 on that now. Now I'm still on the 30 plus. A couple years, I gotta put a 40 plus on there. I'm gonna keep the 30 plus until then though. I've I've known Jesus a long time. And you know what I've come to realize? I need him as much today as I ever have. I need him. I'm more and more aware of my need for Jesus. And whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, I want to tell you that you need him. You need him. And as we come against something that's huge, this problem that's festering, and it's bigger than us, and there's no solution that we have, you know, what is it? And I want to tell you, if you haven't dealt with with, with a big, big problem in your life, you're going to, or maybe you're dealing with one right now. I don't want to tell you, we need to think about what is it, what is it in our life? What is it in our, our marriages or our relationship with our kids or our family? What is it in our work and our vocation? What is it in our, our finances? Maybe it's our health. What is it that we've come up against in those areas that we just say, God, this is a problem, it's a mess, and there's just nothing that I can do about it. We need to come to a place where we ask him to move in those situations. Where we confess, God, I need you. I can't do this. I need you all the time. And that's hard sometimes. The disciples came to a place where where they were able to identify the problem. It was a little bit late. There's a few things they did that could have been better. You know, I think sometimes when we come up against a problem, we have a tendency to uh, procrastinate sometimes. Any procrastinators out there? 
We kind of put it off, put it off. Does that ever make the problem better? It's always worse. You ever have a big assignment or a term paper when you're in school? Ah, I'll worry about that later. I, for me, that never worked out that great when I did that. Procrastinate, we put it off. We pass the buck or the responsibility. It's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. Or we just kind of sit in it and we worry and we stew in worry and we don't really act on anything or we don't do anything. And the disciples actually did all of those things. The first thing the disciples did there is they procrastinated, right? They put off dealing with the problem. Mark 6, 35, it says, by this time it was late in the day. Maybe you're dealing with a problem right now and it feels late in the day. It's been there for a long time and it's festered and it's grown and it's gotten worse. The disciples put it off. They passed the buck, didn't they? They kind of put the responsibility off. Mark chapter 6, 36, what was their reaction? What did we say? They wanted to send the people away. Jesus, we got a problem. Get them out of here. What you're doing's good. It's nice and all, but let's send the people away. I want to tell you something. When, when we're facing a big problem that feels bigger than us, the temptation, I think the human temptation is to always just put it off, to pass the buck. I can't do anything about it. What do I have? What can I do? It's not my problem. It's their problem. Get them out of here. The third one, the disciples just worried about their problems. Can you imagine if we, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Are there any worriers out there? You don't have to raise your hand, but I by nature am a worrier. I worry about things. And, and, and I want to say something, and I want you to receive this today, and I'm with you. This is a, a struggle and a battle in my life, anxiety and, and worry. Worry is not God's plan or purpose for your life. It doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't accomplish the purposes of God in your life. Because worry is just sitting and stewing on things. And so the disciples are worried. They're not doing anything. They're not trying to figure out a solution to the problem. They're just worrying about what the situation is. But if we would spend the amount of time, or if I would spend the amount of time sometimes that I spend fretting or worrying about things, really just praying and seeking the Lord, man, what could God do with that, that kind of faith? We're just reaching out to him. We're looking to him. We've got to recognize our need for God. It's interesting. These guys, uh, these disciples, here they have, they have the creator of all things, the author of life. They have Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega, right there in the flesh, right in front of them. But they're looking for, for KFC to fix their problem. How are we going to feed these people? What are we going to do? And there he is right there. You know, it's easy to look at the disciples and kind of be critical of them for that, but how often do we do that? How often are we looking to the world or worldly things to fix our problems and our anxieties? How, how often are we looking for a miracle from the world? Let me tell you what, people that don't know Jesus, people that don't have Jesus, you know who they're looking for for a miracle? They're looking to politicians. And they're looking to worldly ideologies and they're looking to political parties and they're looking for the world to just get its act together. Miracles don't come from those places. And I want to tell you what, the miracle this world needs, it's Jesus Christ, and we've got him right in front of us. Here we are to celebrate him, to seek him, to, to, to hear from his word. And so often, church, we fall into the same trap of looking to the things that the world, like, well, if, if this would just work out, or if, if this political party would do this or stop doing this, then everything would be great. Rather than just praying and praying for everybody and praying for every situation and saying, God, we need a miracle in this country. And the Republicans can't bring it. The Democrats can't bring it. Nobody in between can bring it. Jesus, it's you and you alone. You're the answer for every person in this country, from every ideology, from every skin tone, from every walk of life. Jesus is the answer. Do we believe that, church? Because we don't live like it. We get caught up in stupid stuff and we spend energy on stupid, I, I shouldn't say it's stupid, it's important stuff, but we look for answers for it in stupid places and we spend our energy in stupid ways, stupid for somebody that knows Jesus. Do you hear, and I'm talking to myself too, 
Rather than just getting on our knees and say, God, we need a miracle. We need a move of your spirit. I don't need any other ideology. I need you to sweep through this place and I need to see a revival brought by your Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit and nothing else. We have a miracle working God. But like the disciples, are we looking to whatever worldly solution there is like the rest of the world? We forget that the all-powerful God Almighty is with us. You think you're in this mess by yourself? You think you're facing this big problem by yourself? I want to tell you what, if you're following Jesus, if you have Jesus, you have a promise in Matthew chapter 28, 20 that he gave to every disciple. He says, surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Whatever you're facing today, and it, I, don't want to, I don't want to minimize it. I don't want to trivialize it. It's, it, it could be huge, devastating But I want to tell you something. He's with you. He hasn't left you. And if he's with me, what are we looking everywhere else for? Let's look to Jesus. What next, Lord? I need you. Getting a little sidetracked here. Listen to Romans chapter 8, 11. I love this verse. I love Romans 8, 11. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You know what that verse says? Because of the cross, because of the resurrection, because of Pentecost, it says that if you have received Jesus and repented of your sins and you are living a life for Christ, the same spirit that was in Jesus when he fed the 5,000, when he had Peter walk on the water, when he healed the blind, when he healed people that couldn't walk or people with leprosy, when he turned water into wine, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, that same spirit has been given to you and lives in you. But we want to look to silly things to get through our problems, to face the big issues in life. Are we living our lives honestly? And I'm challenging myself with this. As a follower of Jesus today, do I live my life? Do I have an attitude? Do I have a spirit? Do I... Do do I live my life like the same power that literally raised Jesus from the dead is alive and well in me? Is that how I'm living? Is that how we're living as a church? We need to recognize our need for God and God alone. The second thing, we need to recognize what we already have. You want to position yourself for a miraculous move of of the Lord in your life, then, then you need to recognize what you already have. We do a realistic analysis of our resources. I want to tell you something. If you're here today, you've got something. You've got breath in your lungs. You had the energy to get here. Praise the Lord. We've all got something, right? We've all got something. And it may not feel like a lot some days, but I want to tell you, we need to come to a place as we understand our need for Jesus. We also need to know that we've been blessed. That, I, that, that, that we're here, that God has already given us something. You don't have nothing. This is what Jesus asked him to do in verse 38. Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said they had five small loaves of bread and two fish. Probably they were little, like, muffiny type things. A couple dried fish, a couple dried sardines. Not much. But you know what? They went and took stock. This is what we have. This is what we have. And so we need to be aware of what we already have. You know why? Because I really believe that God always starts the miracle, that God always does what he's going to do. It starts with what we already have. God doesn't say, I want to do a move if you have this, this, and that. Oh, but you don't have it, so I'm sorry. I can't work in that. But I do believe that the Lord says, what do you have? What can you give for me? What can you surrender to me? And watch what I'll do. Watch what I multiply in that. We're getting ahead a little bit. But God always starts, he always starts with what you have. I believe that with all my heart. Can you imagine being in that situation, people are getting restless, hungry. When people get hungry, especially like really hungry, they get grumpy. Maybe there's some grumpy people around. I don't know. They're like, oh, Lord, 
You know, we got a problem. And Jesus says, yeah, a lot of people here. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of people. Uh, they're getting grumpy. They're getting hungry. And, uh, you know, it's late. We probably, probably need to tell them to go. And Jesus looks at you, if you're that disciple, and says, you feed them. <laughs> you feed them. That's what he did. That'd be intimidating. Pastor, wouldn't that be intimidating? Man. That'd be intimidating. But that's what he did. And I believe in our lives, there's things that God is asking us to do. There are things that God is uh, asking us to overcome that, frankly, they're bigger than us. They're bigger than us. I, um, I had somebody tell me this week with good intention. You know, one of the, the what I believe one of the biggest theological fallacies there are in the church that there is in the church today. There's a fallacy, and I. And if this bursts your bubble, but I just, I, I got to speak the word of God here. There's, there's an understanding. And I, I had somebody tell me this week, oh, hang in there, pastor. Um, God will never give you more than you can handle. You heard that? Maybe you believe that today. And I want to tell you something. That's not biblical. In fact, I can tell you, if you want, you, oh, no, I'm sure I've heard it. I've heard it, pastor. It's in there. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13. This is where people take that notion. And, and this is what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 really says. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And so that quote that people take speaks directly to temptation, that God has always given us a way out, that we can always serve Jesus, that there's always a way to follow Jesus if we would surrender to him. That's what the idea of uh, the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Spirit and, and, and the idea of holiness is, is that we surrender to, 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 the, to the leading of the Spirit in our lives. But it's speaking about temptation, you know, and, and people take that verse and they twist it with good intentions and they say, God will never give you more than you can handle. Just hang in there. And I believe that that fallacy has done immense damage in the church to countless people because they say, wow, God can never, he won't give me more than I can handle, but man, I, feel, I can't handle this. I'm overwhelmed. Maybe God's abandoned me. Because I can't do this. And, and, and friends, I want to tell you something. The, big, the biblical principle actually is over and over and over again that God's will for your life is for you to constantly walk in faith and be in situations that are bigger than you. Things you can't handle. Tell Jesus himself on the night he was arrested when he was praying, when he was saying, God, would you take this cup from me? And he sweat blood. And he said, not my will, but your will be done. Tell Jesus that God won't give you more than you can handle. <laughs> it's not in there, friends. God allows things into our life that are bigger than us. Challenges. Because he wants to bring us to a place where we're completely reliant and dependent on him. That's God's will for you and for me is this deep relationship with him and it comes from this place that we know our need, from God, our need for God. And God allows these things, but he doesn't leave us and he makes a way and he gives us a miracle because let me tell you what, when you're in the midst of something that's beyond you, God gets all the glory when the miracle happens, doesn't it? Because it's like, man, I couldn't have done that. That was bigger than me. And our faith grows as we grow in him. We need to recognize what we already have. God starts with what you have. The third thing, the third principle, position ourselves for a miraculous move of Jesus in our life. We need to give God what we already have. We need to give God what we already have. Now we've taken stock. I know what, we ha what I have. I'm gonna give that to the Lord. And I'm not, just, I, I'm not just talking about money here. This is, you know, money may be part of it. Finance is part of it. But I'm talking about our energy, our time, uh, j j just our focus, our acts of service. I can't do much. But what can you do? You've got something, you've got something to give. The way we pray, because here's the thing, I really believe this. If you go and you read this story in, in, in the book of John, if you, if you read later in the book of John, the same account of this story, 
in the book of John, we're told, that, we're told where they get the, the loaves and fishes. Anybody remember where they got it? John tells us there was a little boy, had a little sack lunch <laughs> of some loaves and fishes. And, and you know what that boy did? Gave it. They didn't take it. Give me that. <laughs> Line them up. We're going to see who's got food. They said, man, who's got anything to eat? And this little boy had a little lunch. I'm just being honest. You look at me. I've gone all day without food. I might have been like, that's my lunch. <laughs> I'm not giving my lunch. <laughs> it's not very much. It's not even enough for me. What good could that do? What good will come of me just giving it to them and now I don't even get to eat and neither's really anybody else? Was that the spirit of the little boy? The Bible says that the boy gave willingly. Here's mine. It's, every, it's a, just a little bit. And I want to tell you something, friends. I want to tell you this is so true that God will use whatever you give to him. And I want to say this. Notice I didn't say that God will use whatever you have, but God will use whatever you give to him. And the more you give to him, the more he'll use that. God will use acts of service. He'll use the time that you give him, the energy that you give him. God will use whatever resource that you pour into the kingdom into being obedient for him. God will take that, friends, and he multiplies it. Do you believe that? I don't want to tell you something. If you're in this room today, you have something that God's given you that you could offer to the kingdom whether it's encouraging a neighbor in the Lord, whether it's praying for somebody that needs prayer, even if it's awkward or a little, oh, I don't know about that. Whether it's, I, I don't know, there's all kinds of things, whether it's service to the church, whether it's service to the community. God has given you something to give. Sometimes we have, we feel inadequate or we feel like we don't have a lot and we just, we kind of want to protect the little bit that we have. Rather than to lay it at the feet of Jesus, say, God, would you do what you want to do with this. There's a great quote from Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you don't do than the things you did do. So throw off the bowlines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds, end your sails, explore, dream, discover. I love that idea. I, I really do believe that's true, that we'll regret more of the things we didn't do that God opened the door for, that God has called us into, than the things that we, that we do. Maybe they don't work out. You know, in the office, sometimes we get crazy ideas, ministries. Hey, let's do this thing. And some of them have worked out great. You know, we've, we've, we've done a, a lot of ministry that's gone from this church. I'm so thankful that you partner with us and that we're partnered together in this. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are some things that were like, hey, let's do this thing. Wouldn't this be great? And then it's just, Pow! it's just a bomb. <laughs> it just doesn't work out. It's okay. You know what I tell our staff? Man, when we fail, we're going to fail moving forward in the Lord. <laughs> we're going to fail being ambitious, saying we, we're going to be active in following the Lord. We're going to try to reach as many people with the gospel as we can. And if it doesn't work out, We'll move on to the next thing. But when we miss a move of God or something that God wants to do and we were too scared and we sat and we didn't do it, oh, the pain, the tragedy of that. I think about Peter. I, uh, 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 remember when Peter was on the boat and Jesus was walking on the water and Peter said, hey, call me, Lord, if that's you. They thought it was a ghost. Ah! said, Lord, if that's really you, call me out on the water and I'll come to you. And Peter got out of that boat. Can you imagine that first step out of that boat when he put his foot on that water and didn't go down? Oh, then he put all his weight on that foot to get his other foot on the water. Think of that moment. And then what happened? <laughs> he started thinking about what was happening. He says, I can't do this. This is impossible. Oh my gosh, there might be sharks down there. I'm going to sink. I'm going to swim that. I don't know, whatever, whatever fear started to consume, he started to sink. And I've preached on that message or, or that verse many times. And, and sometimes I'm like, man, Peter's kind of a, like, come on, Peter. 
You were already on the water. What happened? But you know what? I've, I've, I've reevaluated how I feel about Peter in that verse. Because you, you know what? Peter saw Jesus and he got out of the boat. And he started to sink. But there were 11 other people in that boat that were happy to just sit and watch. I'm not going out there. I don't care if Jesus is out there or not. I'm not getting out. And I've, I, I've come to realize, friends, I, and I really mean this. At the end of my life, I think I would regret sitting a whole lot more than I would regret sinking. I want to be wet. I don't want to have a sore backside because I sat too long. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, if that's possible. You get what I'm saying? I want to say, yeah, there have been some mishaps, but man, I went for it. I did my best to follow him. And he was faithful, and he didn't let me drown. Even when I sank, he pulled me right back up. And we kept going. That's how I want to live my life. That's how I want us to live our life, church. You hear what I'm saying? That we trust, that we have a miracle-working, powerful God, that even when we fall short and start to sink, he's right there, and he's got us to pull us back up. What can God do if we would trust him? God loves. God loves to do extraordinary things. Extraordinary things with very ordinary things that are given to him. God loves to do that kind of thing. This little boy's lunch, he gave it willingly. He did it cheerfully. Worship team, if you come up, we're going to close in just a second. He did it immediately. He didn't hesitate. You know what he didn't do when they got the food? He didn't wait for it all to make sense. Sometimes I, I find myself waiting for things to make sense in the kingdom. Well, I feel the Spirit's leading me this way, but I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. Maybe when that makes more sense, I can step out. This boy didn't do that. He just, he just went for it, man, immediately. He didn't want to miss what Jesus was going to do. I'll tell you what, too. If you're waiting for, for, the, for God's ways to make sense, if you're waiting for the things that Jesus wants us to do to always make sense, you're going to be waiting a long time. I, um, you know, as I'm looking at my mom back there, it doesn't make sense for me to be up here today. It just doesn't. You know why? Because I have grown up, and God hasn't removed this from my life. I think I've shared this with you before. I have a very, it was more severe in the past. I've overcome some of it. But, but I, from childhood, even into my adult life, I have severe, like, social anxiety. I love people, but sometimes it's excruciating for me to be around people because I just, I never know what to say. Uh, truly. I feel like I have nothing to offer to say, and, it, and it's, it's this thing. And even as a kid, I remember my parents got so mad at me one birthday. They threw this big birthday party for me. And all these people came over, and it was excruciating and you remember what I did? I went in my room and I closed the door and I started reading a book. <laughs> and my mom was like, what are you doing? Get out there. There's all these people here. I was like, ah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't that I didn't like the people, but it was just like, ah. You know what? I still deal with that. I still deal with that. I feel like I have nothing to say. I feel like I have nothing to offer anyone. And I, I get extremely... I'm good around two or three people, but when you pass that, and, and Sonia will tell you this, even in family functions, people that I love and trust dearly, when it gets to be about five or six people, it is hard for me. It's draining. It's not about anybody else. It's about me. And so all that to say, when I was a teenager and I really felt like God really impressed on my heart that someday I was going to go into the pastorate. I was about 16, 17 years old when I started to really, it was this battle because I couldn't escape it. I felt it. I dreamt about it. But I was like, I, I, that, that God's either wrong or that inkling that I have, that pull that I have is not of God because it's impossible. I would never be able to get up in a microphone or let somebody record me while I'm talking so that we can send it out to as many people as possible. I'd never be able to stand in front of somebody and read the Bible and tell them what I thought about it in Bible studies or 
I'd never be able to walk into the hospital room of somebody who's dying and be the only person there to talk to, because I have nothing, I'll never be that person. It doesn't make sense. Friends, it didn't make sense. It doesn't even totally make sense today. But I'm so thankful that God's bigger than that. I'm so thankful that at some point I stopped waiting for it to make sense and I just said, God, I just want to do what I feel you're leading me to do because you're bigger than that. The truth is, is this, the fourth point, and we'll end on this, the fourth point is that whatever you give to God, he always blesses more in return. That whatever, even if it feels meager, even if it feels like, Lord, I don't have much to say. I'm not that eloquent with my words, but I'll do my best and I'll give the little bit that I have. God always multiplies. God will always bless more. And I'm not talking about monetary or I'm not talking about earthly material kind of blessings that, oh, you're going to be rich or you're going to be, all your problems are going to go away. Not, not that, but blessings in the Lord that God God will always give more than we give. Do you believe that, church? That God wants to take what we give and he wants to multiply that for the kingdom and the glory. And you know what? God wants us to partner with him. He doesn't want to just work in our lives. He wants to work through our lives and in our lives. That's amazing, friends. But we have to be willing to step out and we need to ask ourselves what need is it that God wants us to recognize and confess to him today? What thing are we dealing with that maybe we haven't just given to him and said, God, I need you to move in this. What resource is God waiting on uh, for us to recognize that we already have? What has God given us that we take for granted? God's waiting for us to at least recognize, man, I, I have this. And then what is God waiting on for us to give to him? There's something that God says, I know the problem's big. I know the issue's big. It's bigger than you. But you have something. Would you give it to me? And would you start to use it for my glory? And friends, when we do that, I believe that he'll move. I know he already moves in our life, but I believe. I would love to see this church filled 10 times a Sunday with people getting baptized, getting saved. I would love to see the Baptist church down the street filled 10 services a day. It's not about this church. I would love our friends uh, up the street here, Great Grace, to be filled 20 times a day with people. And as much as I want that, you know who wants it even more? Jesus. This is his church. And he's placed us here so that people can know him and find him. And if Jesus wants it, I believe that there's a move, a miraculous move of the Spirit that, 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 that he wants to take place in his church. I believe that. But I also believe that we got to position ourselves in a place of faith. It's called walking in step with the Spirit. I don't want to be in step with what the Spirit of God is doing so we can experience a miraculous move of God in his church. And I believe for our lives that you have things that you're dealing with at work, things that you're dealing with at home, family issues that are huge. And I want to tell you something. God wants to move in a miraculous way in, that, in those situations. But we need to have faith and we need to trust him and we need to position ourselves in a way that we can receive and be in the middle of God's movement and what God wants to do because it's his will, not our will. Amen? I'm going to invite you at this time. Uh, I'm going to have Pastor Sam and Pastor Heather, Pastor Mike um, come down, and they're just going to be here. If you need prayer, uh, Sonny's going to sing a song for us, and as we sing together, um, if you just, man, I got that thing, Pastor, and I just would really love somebody to pray for an increase in my faith, that I need to pray for a miraculous move in my life in this area, in this relationship, in this health issue, in this financial issue, whatever it is, uh, they're here, they're going to pray with you. So as we sing, I just invite you to come down to the altar and let us pray with you. Um, Let's pray, and then we're going to sing. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your goodness. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a miracle-working God. And, Lord, we declare that we trust you and we love you today. We lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. Come and receive prayer.
pour me out upon the waters the great unknown the feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery ocean deep my faith will stay I will call upon My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, you are my own. Grace abounds and deep is the waters, your sovereign
Jesus, our eyes are on you today, Lord. I pray that you would be each and be with each and every one of us today, Lord. We, In fact, Lord, we just thank you that I know because of your word, your promises that you are with us, Lord. And even as we leave this place that you go with us, Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we pray that you would help us to be aware of that in every situation, everything that we face this week, Lord. And we give it to you, Lord, and we declare our trust in you. And Lord, we pray for just a move of your spirit in our lives, in our families, in our schools and places of work, Lord, we, in our communities, our neighbors, Lord Jesus, we pray for a miraculous move of your spirit. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. I am so glad that you're here today. I'm so glad that we've had this time. Church, be encouraged. God is good. All the time, God is good, and God is big. He's a big God, and he's powerful. And I want to tell you something. Would you receive this? He's got you. Jesus has you. He loves you, and he's with you. He hasn't left you. This week, uh, I'm really excited. We're going to start our Wednesday nights back up at 630 this Wednesday. Uh, the teens are going to meet. Uh, the adults are going to meet. It's going to be a little bit different than uh, in the past. I know it's been a while, so maybe you don't even remember. But but uh, Bible study, we're going to be going through the book of John, line by line, verse by verse. We're going to start this Wednesday, 630, and we're going to start in here. We're going to meet in here. We're going to have about 10 minutes to just uh, maybe sing together, but we're also going to spend some prayer time in here. And then from here, the groups will kind of go into their, their study areas uh, our group might just stay in here because they're more comfortable, but we'll see. Anyways, teens can go somewhere else. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maybe not. I don't know. Wednesday's going to be a lot of fun. Man, I've missed it, just being in the Word together. So come on down. If you've never been, this is a great time to start. Uh, Wednesday, 6.30, the book of John. Uh, we're really excited this Thursday. Another great opportunity at Del Thorn Park, really close by. It's over here. We have Walkers of Christ. Lydia. Conrad, love you guys. Lydia leads our Walkers of Christ group, and we just get together, we pray together, and we walk. It's good. It's fun. And it's great to be out in the community and praying for the community together and getting exercise. Praise the Lord. So that's this Thursday, 4 p.m. at Del Thorne. Uh, and then we have uh, online, uh, South Bay Nazarene. We have all of our services online, Bible studies, uh, all kinds of stuff on there. The website, torrentsnaz.com, has information. Um, you can give online securely. There's a little button to give. Uh, if it's easier for you, you could, we have these boxes back here. You can put your check uh, or your offering in there. But church, I want to thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. Thank you. And I know that God honors that. Uh, let's just pray for our offering before we leave. Dear Jesus, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, we just declare that it's a privilege and an honor to be faithful and to give back to you what we have, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would receive the offering that's come in this week, Lord, that you would bless the gift and that you would bless the giver. And more than anything, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and that you would be lifted up through our offerings, Lord. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.